So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending to this webinar. We are a student from Raffles University, and we are glad that we have the opportunity to sharing about what is social psychology. So the first question come out is that, can we live without socialize with others? The answer is no. One of the quarters, Herman, he said that we can't leave ourselves alone. And this is true. Specifically, the social psychology will tell us why we have to socialize with others. So today here we have four groups discussing about different topics. For the first group, they will explore about how people think toward the mental illness people, such as the bipolar, uh, people with the bipolar or schizophrenia, social anxiety, or even depression. The next group, which is the second group, will explain about how we being influenced when we are inside a group. When there is a big project, we need to voice out or we need to listen to the others. So after that, the third group will be showing us how people being attracted and some interesting fact about close relationship. This is more interesting topic for the couple. And the last group will be presenting why some people come to help the others, why they have this kind of action want to help and why we conform to the other's opinion or change their own belief when inside a group. First of all, let me introduce the topic, um, which is social perception towards the mental illness people. And this is the first group presenter. Let's welcome our presenter, Pauvia and Ihui. Okay. Hi, and a very good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I'm really very glad to participate in this webinar program. So today, my teammate, Yi Hui, and I, Pavia Gunasega, going to present one of the topics from social psychology. Before introducing our topic, let's see a picture and observe the scenario given in that image. In this image, we can see that one fellow telling that he can see four wooden blocks, while another person just can see three wooden blocks only. So based on this image, there are no right or wrong answers as everyone having a different opinion on a certain issues and everyone looking at the world in a different way. So what I'm trying to say is everyone having different perceptions and perception just matters. The topic of the day is social perception. Social perception refers to the ability to make accurate interpretation and inferences about other people from their general physical appearance, verbal and non-verbal patterns of communications. Things like facial expression, tone of voice, hand gestures, and body position or movement are all quest people with higher levels of social perception pick up onto how work uh, pick up onto work out what other people are thinking, feeling, or likely to do next. Uh, okay, now I'm going to introduce our topic. Our topic is society perception towards mentally ill people. Next is why people should find this topic interesting. This topic can make more people know about this issue. Although some of them may not encounter people with mental illness, even though the people have no sins or interact with mentally ill people, they already make a judgment or have some negative opinion about them based on the stereotypes set by society. So through this presentation, the audience can find this topic interesting since we are providing the facts. Why society set negative stereotypes on mentally ill people? What factor influence them to come up with this belief? and how to overcome this issue or how to break the stereotype. Through this presentation or topic, people are able to enhance their knowledge on how to treat mentally ill people in the right manner. And they also can spread awareness about this issue via cyberspace to comment or post something good about the mentally ill people. Therefore, if they know about this issue, can help them to become more empathetic. In this topic, we are going to cover these three subtopics, which are the social cell, perceiving person, stereotype, prejudice, and discrimination, seeing these three are the main topics in social perception. These two pictures indicate that 
some people are ignoring the signal from people with mental illness and just think that they do not have any problem. Therefore, the people always will tell them it's okay, you will get well soon and did not take it seriously about this issue until something bad happened. The people just realized that mental illness is a serious issue. Although people cannot really see, do not mean it is not there. As they are already suffering from their mental illness and this prejudice, stigma, stereotype hurt them more physically and mentally. And this is our agenda for today. They include stereotype, prejudice, discrimination, labeling, stigmatization, way to promote psychological well-being and educate people about how to treat mentally ill people in the right manner. Okay, the society's perception toward mentally ill people is influenced by the stereotype. In social psychology, stereotypes means by a very, very overgeneralized assumption about a certain group of individuals. Uh, it is an assumption that individual can have for any people in a specific community. It also believes that associate a whole group of people with certain traits. So, society's stereotype about people with mental illness is they are prone to be violent and involved in criminal activities. The reason for the society come up with this particular stereotype about mentally ill people is because of the media's coverage about them. Uh, there is a desire to stress a perceived link between violence and mental disorder in today's media's coverage on mental illness. However, just a few particular mental illness are correlated with violence, such like first episode psychosis and schizophrenia with positive symptoms such as hallucination and coma delusion. But the majority of the violent people are not suffering from mental disorders. In fact, the mentally ill people are being as a victim rather than the culprit of making violence. They are having a negative impact of this stereotype on people with mental illness, which is the society isolate the mentally ill people since the society is scared of being attacked by them. <clears throat> Now, we are having a question that why the society behaving in that way as isolating the mentally ill people? This is because of the self-fulfillment prophecy. First of all, a self-fulfilling prophecy is a sociological term used to describe a prediction that causes itself to become true. Therefore, the process by which a person's expectation about someone can lead that someone behaving in ways which confirm the expectation. If they have stereotypes of an individual, they prefer to handle the individual according to their belief only. This treatment will influence the individual to behave in line with their stereotypical expectation and thereby reinforce their stereotypical belief. Based on this diagram, we can see clearly how the self-fulfillment prophecy works. As I previously mentioned, society believes that mentally ill people are more prone to be violent and involved in criminal cases. So their belief influence their action, which call as self-fulfillment prophecy, as they isolate the mentally ill people. Finally, this kind of isolation caused the victim to feel lonely, and this loneliness wasn't their mental disorders as create depression and stress. After that, <clears throat> confirmation bias would be another factor that can sustain the stereotypes. Confirmation bias is the tendency to interpret new evidence as confirmation of one's existing belief or theories. Society prefer to pay attention to information that is consistent with their stereotypical perception as the community communicates with the target of discrimination and disregard knowledge that is conflicting with their perception. In this case, when the society meets an individual with mental illness, they started to imagine like he or she involved in a crime cases or behave violently. They also keep looking for negative information of the victim to match with their stereotypical expectation and ignore all the positive elements. Okay, now I'm going to explain the next subtopic, which is prejudice and discrimination. Prejudice is an unjustified attitude toward a person based solely on the membership of the person in a social community. Prejudice also refers to the values, feelings, emotions, and behaviors towards a category that someone keeps. Whereas discrimination is a negative conduct or act against a person or a group of people. 
To add on, there is a huge difference between prejudice and discrimination. For example, prejudice includes all three components of an attitude, which is affective, behavioral, and cognitive, while discrimination just involves behavior. The society discriminates mentally ill people through social distancing, which means they just maintaining a distance from mentally ill people. This social distance is also influenced by two kinds of prejudices, which is authoritarianism and nevolence. Authoritarianism is the belief that person with mental illness cannot care for themselves, so a paternalistic health system must do so. Whereas, whereas nevolence is the belief that person with mental illness are innocent and childlike. So, these two kinds of prejudices will influence their actions as social distancing, social distancing the mentally ill people. Moreover, this will worsen their mental disorders as well. Okay, now I'm going to show you one picture. And when seeing this picture, people will think that this guy always behave in a bad way and look like a gangster. Actually, he is a warm person and always take care of the children. Although he is a delinquent, sometimes we need to see the behind story and avoid simply label people with a certain word. Now I'm going to talk about labeling and stigma. What are labeling and stigmatization? Stigma is being persistently stereotyping, perceived as the value in society to a person or group of people when their characteristics or behavior are viewed as different from societal norms. Categorized people is labeling, people applying a name to a situation or a pattern of behavior. The label may contain negative connotation or be applied wrongly to the person rather than that person's behavior. Next, I will be going to discuss the impact of stigma on people with mental illness. The stigma associated with mental illness continue to be a significant barrier to health seeking, leading to negative attitude about mental health treatment and deterring individuals who need service from seeking care. Stigma have a detrimental effect on stigma, stigmatizing person's life, which may even hamper or delay the health seeking behavior which increase the duration of untreated mental illness. The stigma also harm the, the self-esteem of many people who have serious mental illness. Stigma also prevent employment and lead to people with mental illness hard to get a job opportunity. Next is the impact of laboring towards mental illness people. The diagnosis of mental illness has become increasingly reinfined. People are being labeled and they are seen as being mentally ill instead of having a mental illness. Society might call a person by their diagnosis. Labeling has a negative impact on self-concept. And the meaning of self-concept is everything one knows and thinks about oneself. Once labeled, individuals with a disorder may identify with the negative connotation associated with the label due to being labeled and lead to lower their self-esteem and self-efficacy. Furthermore, is the media effect. The media contribute to mental illness stigma through overstanded, inaccurate, and comical image. They used to portray person with psychiatric disorder as well as providing incorrect information about mental illness. In the essence of experience with people with mental illness, Individual ready on the media for their perception of those who have mental illness. Research has shown that negative view of individual which view of individual with mental illness are directly proportional to the time spent watching television. The next one is social identity theory, and this theory has three process which is social categorization, social identification, and social comparison. Social identity theory is an interventionist social psychological theory of the rule of self conception and associate cognitive processes and social belief in group processes and intergroup relation. In the social categorization step, people categorize objects to understand and identify them. The second dash is social identification. 
people use the identity of the group they have categorized themselves as belonging to. The final stage is a social comparison. People started to compare that group with other groups. People with mental illness experience stigma, stereotype, prejudice, and discrimination. They are divided into two groups, which are society and victim. As you can see in this picture, all these components join together and form a stigma. And the component includes stereotype, prejudice, discrimination, labeling, and dimension of us versus them. Dimension us versus them is the social identity theory. Next, I will discuss the way to promote psychological well-being among the victim. They are therapy for the victim of prejudice and discrimination. Therapy can help people with prejudicial attitude overcome those attitude and work toward lasting social change. The right therapy may also help individuals suggest to discrimination, recover a sense of self-worth, and fight back against the care that is unfair or harmful. For example, a person who struggles with depression due to social isolation may benefit from cognitive behavioral therapy, and a person who has experienced abuse due to negative stereotype may benefit from trauma-informed approach such as eyes movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. Uh, we come up with several ways to educate people about how to treat mentally ill people in a right way. As the first way to educate society on how to treat mentally ill people correctly is through an awareness campaign. So this awareness campaign also will be conducted by social psychologists as they are specialists in explaining clearly about the social issues and its impacts. In this campaign, the psychologists will show some short educational video about how the negative stereotypes, discrimination and prejudices about mentally ill people will physically and mentally affect them. So, after watching these videos, the participants will know about the struggles of mentally ill people and afterwards, they will not discriminate them anymore. Moreover, through this campaign, they can have intergroup contact between the social group and the victim group. As this both group of people will be participating in this campaign and they have a high chances for them to interact with them each other. Through this communication, we can reduce the prejudice, discrimination, and stereotypes, which is known as contact hypothesis. The contact hypothesis is based on the premise that peaceful and respectful interaction can minimize group's prejudices and encourage greater communication and friendly relationship. Okay, we also can choose social media platform to spread awareness to society. Based on the statistics show that they have 3.81 billion people use social media worldwide. Therefore, we can use social media platform to set up this issue and educate society to treat people with mental illness in the right way and we must involve an authority person. This is because when we involve an authority person, society will be more likely to accept and easy to persuade the public public and people will also share the correct information in their group to help people to understand this issue. Lastly, I'm going to talk about the correct way to treat people with mental illness. The first one is social support. Social support play a huge role in recovery from several mental illness. The people around them can try to listen to them without any judgment and focus on their needs at that moment. Ask what you can help and listen to their responses carefully and encourage them to seek professional help. The second one is employment. People with mental illness experience a high level of unemployment and hard to get a job. Therefore, the employer needs to be open-minded and attend to accept them because they know that's scary as people imagine and the employer can also provide counseling service to help them and enhance their well-being. The last one is attitude. People need to take it seriously and take action to do something that can help them. We need to put ourselves in someone else's shoe and being empathetic to understand their situation and imagine when you are the one with mental illness, you wish people how to treat you. 
a take home message from our side is please 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 don't discriminate mentally ill people based on the society stereotype and prejudices please don't make any prejudgment about others since it will influence our actions as well so be calm respect positivity and love since we are human we are all equal stay cool guys and thank you so much for listening and have a good day guys and thank you thank you so thank you for the first group presenting stereotype is really a big issue in every country and also mental illness people will feel disappointed if no one understand them everyone just find all the negative or wrong from them but not realizing they are also a human furthermore Social perception also help us to know others feeling and how they are thinking and we can actually sense their sense their uh, feeling and facial such as facial expression or body language or we can know about their behavior through their voice which is maybe their emotion is fear anxiety or upset they also talk about the three kind of the social perception which is stereotype, prejudice, discrimination, and also labeling. So self-fulfillment prophecy, they actually told us about how people can really uh, seek to find the evidence to believe what is true. For example, the confirmation bias, they will, if I believe a person is crazy, I will try to imagine that uh, they, they are really a crazy person. And I find I will find more and more evidence about the, that guy is really a crazy person. And I will, through their behavior, I find the worries or they are changing mood. Maybe they are happy or sad. And also prejudice and discrimination. I will, so if I am a discrimination people, I will just group by group. I would just group them of oh, the other mental illness people, which is feel they will feel uncomfortable. And lastly, also the labeling, which is media effect. Media, uh, in the social media, the people always will tell the others or they will see the information from the media or oh, the mental illness people is always the one who need care. They are irresponsible they are cannot decide their life and they always show fear so this they also talk about the social avoidance which is uh, one of my friends she also uh, is a depression people she um she was like unwilling to spend some event with the others because she's a depression people and others will feel her and think that she is a mental illness people and stop talking with her. So this is what social perception talks about. Next, we welcome the second group. They will talk about the topic, which is social influence in the group. So let's welcome TJ and Matthew. Okay, so uh, first of all, before we begin our session, I would like to say that me and Matthew have put together a little bit of a story for you guys. It will be in the slides. So you guys have to notice that. And if you notice that, hopefully it will help you guys understand what we are trying to tell today. Because in presentations, right, it's not always easy to understand what someone is telling. So through pictures and through our slides, we tried our best to show you guys what we are talking about today, which is social influence in group process. Okay, so I'm gonna start now. A very good afternoon to my lecturer, Dr. Sam, Miss Lane, as well as the fellow audience. For today's agenda, we are going to discuss social issues such as riots that relates to our psychology topic. Like I said just now, social influence in group process. Okay, so when we hear the word riot, the first question that comes to our mind is, what are riots? They are actually a form of civil disorder, commonly characterized by a group lashing out in a violent public disturbance against authority, property, or people. 
some effects of riots include destruction of property and public or private and harm to individuals. So what do the police do when riots emerge? They use riot control methods such as attack dogs, water cannons, plastic bullets, rubber bullets, pepper spray, flexible baton rounds, and snatch squads. Nevertheless, a huge crowd is formed during riots due to the fact that as more and more people join the riot, the risk of being arrested goes down, which persuades still more people to join into the riots. Moving on, there are three theories which explain the cause of riots. The first, mad mob theory. This theory suggests that individuals lose their sense of self, reason and rationality in a crowd. And so they do things that otherwise they might not do as an individual. The second one is that collective violence is the product of a convergence of bad or criminal persons with predispositions together in the same space. The third theory is a combination of the first two where evil and unscrupulous people, often outsiders or enemies, take advantage of the gullibility of the crowd in order to use them as a tool for destruction. People in riots act according to their assumed social identities and do not behave mindlessly. As if subject to an irrational group mind, mere exposure to the behavior of others leads observers to act in the same way According to this line of thinking, behavior is spread via a process of contagion, transmitted automatically from one person to another. Okay, so we move on to some explanations. Uh, some of the uh, further explanations from just now regarding riots would be that mob provides cover and anonymity that makes it easier to overcome one's usual reticence or moral scruples and it can become an exuberant experience, right? A joyful release for long suppressed emotions. It can also become manic, driven, a means of restlessly seeking new outlets. This is not only to justify the behavior of the mob, but to recognize that we all can easily become hooligans ourselves. To be sure, delinquents and petty thieves can easily join in under the cover the mob provides. When People in power fail to address the problems facing the oppressed who are very often marginalized and minority individuals An uprising will inevitably happen. Riots often serve as an indirect source of social change by bringing dramatic attention to collective resentment and frustration. In order to understand why riots occur, we must address the source of rioting rather than the outcome of rioting. Participation in riots even temporarily frees one from adherence to immediate social norms. Now I will pass the slides to Matthew to carry on the presentation. All right, so why should one see this as an interesting topic? Well, we are able to learn more about the reasons we, we join groups that we are currently in. Next, grab more on the aspects that forms a group such as role, norms, and understand why people put in more effort than others when they are in groups and also solve issues regarding so uh, next the first key feature of group roles in which each individual each in each individual place hence there are two roles, individual and expressive role. The, the instrumental role helps the group achieve its task and the expressive role provides an emotional support and maintain morale in a group. Groups function better when members are assigned roles that best match their talents and personalities. For instance, uh, kinesthetic learners are much more suited for jobs that, that require physical and those which require reading. Role uncertainty, ability, and conflict are also associated with poorer job performance 
as well as a variety of other problems, including interpersonal and emotional exhaustion. Group members can become so absorbed in their role that they themselves and their personal beliefs and sense of morality in their group role. Interrogators of, of a prisoner or suspect they get so lost in their role they recognize in the acts that they are crossing. In addition to roles from, for members, groups also establish group norms, group uh, establish group norms that there is actually rules of, of conduct for members. Navies from norms can threaten groups members' sense of uniformity and social identity with the group. For example, or new group members may try to establish a stronger position in a group, especially punishing of members who break group norms. High status uh, group members. On the other hand, uh, group members who are highly identified with the group and care about its collective successes may be willing to deviate from a group norm if they think that the norm is slightly to harm the group. One would, be, one would be willing to switch business strategies if they are willing to deviate from the group norm. Next, groups who share, whose members share attitudes and closely follow the group norms are more likely than other groups to be cohesive. Members who are cohesive tend to feel uh, committed to the group task, feel positive towards the group members, feel group pride, and engage in many interactions in a group. Group cohesiveness is known as the extent to which forces push groups and members closer together, such as through feeling of intimacy, unity, commitment to group goals. Hence, it can be certain to say that higher group cohesiveness leads to higher group performance. All right, next. Now, let's move on into explaining what groups actually are. A group is a set of indi uh, individuals who have direct interactions with each other or fear of share a common fate, identity, or set of goals. It can also consist The reasons why one should join a group would be having an need to belong. This is to feel psychological needs as a human, which includes autonomy, competence, relatedness. Protect, uh, protect against threat and uncertainty because we have people that work hand in hand with us and also provides a sense of personal and social identity. Have you ever thought why we put more effort in some whereas less in others? Well, social facilitation. It is a process whereby the presence of others enhances performance on easy tasks, but impairs performance on difficult tasks. We tend to put in more effort when it's cycle in a if there's a crowd, then when we cycle social loafing, however, is a group produced reduction in individual are put on tasks where contributions are pulled. When, when performing collectively, we tend to loathe exerted less effort. For example, when we are clapping hands in a group, we actually tend to put in less effort, such as creating less noise. Here's a fun fact. Here's a fun fact 
that is women from East Asian cultures who are collectivists tend to perform social loafing less than Western cultures who are individualistic. Next, there is also de-individuation, which means the loss of a person's sense of and the reduction of normal constraints. Again, the best example to explain this would be the riot mentioned, as well as when a group of when a group of sports fans excited at their home team's victory. The factors of de-individuation consist of accountability cues and attentional cues. When accountability is low, those who commit deviant acts are less likely to, caught, to be caught and punished. And people may deliberately choose to engage in gratifying but usually inhibited behaviors. Attentional cues focus a person's attention away from the self. When you're at a party with very loud music and flashing lights, you may be swept up with the pulsating crowd and feel your individual identity slipping away. Okay, uh, furthermore, innate problems could also occur in groups. And those would be group think and group or the exaggeration of initial tendencies in the thinking of group members through group discussion. Groupthink would be a group decision-making style characterized by an excessive tendency among group members to seek concurrence. An, uh, con concurrence basically means an agreement of uniformity, right? In influencing factors would include high cohesiveness, group structure and stressful situations, whereas consequences would include increased pressures towards uniformity and defective decision-making. Okay. In terms of culture and diversity of groups, in terms of culture and diversity of groups, miscommunications and misunderstandings are more likely to arise among heterogeneous group members. However, Somers in 2006 found that racially diverse juries exchanged a wider range of information, cited more facts about the case being decided, and made fewer errors in their deliberation. Lastly, social dilemma is a situation in which a self-interested choice by everyone will create the worst outcome for everyone. Imagine you and your friend being questioned by the court since you committed a crime. If neither of you confess, they will both get light sentences on the minor charge. If both confess and plead guilty, they will both receive somewhat longer sentences. But if one confesses and the other stays silent, the confessing criminal will go free, while the silent criminal will pay the maximum penalty. And that's, it. that's what is called the prisoner's dilemma. As for the resource dilemmas, which concern how two or more people share a limited resource, Okay, so while we are in the referential section, I would like to give you uh, guys a take home message, which is social influence is bound to happen regardless of what we do about it. We don't have a choice, right? Whether we get to influence someone socially or not, but we can make a choice whether we positively influence them or negatively influence them. So make a good choice, positively influence others instead of negatively influencing others, which would cause really bad things like riots and everything. So these are the references and thank you guys for listening to us. Thank you for TJ and Matthew presenting. Okay. So riot, which is protest, also happens severely in some country. And then some community, they are not satisfied about some event, 
situation or policy. They will express express in riot way, which is throw a fire towards the police, hurt the others, or destroy the public equipment. As soon as the mad mob theory come out, they tell they study that the people who actually they will lose emotion when they when they are riot or they are protest. They lost control over themselves. This can be explained why some people do the criminal without sense of the self. That is, for example, when we see the others like throwing a fire towards the police, then we we also will throw that we without sense of ourselves unconsciously. Next, the, the Matthew also he also tells us about the role in the group, how we maintain our role inside the group. There is five things, which is we must trust each other, we must manage conflict, even in the industry or in the office or factory, and we must commitment to the others. Also, we must focus on the result when there is a big project come up, and we must be responsible in achieving the goal. So when there is achieving the goal, when they're doing the big project, they must they have the two social uh, situation will happen, which is social facilitation and also a social loving. Social facilitation, like just now the Matthew he mentioned, when there is a big project in the group, somebody will do more job. And by alternatively, the social loving will tell us that when there is a big project and somebody will do less job as compared to the others, but they still get the same salary rather than uh, so rather than others so they talk about the conflict in society which also talk about the conflict might occur in the group they also have the group polarization group thinking and there is a best way for every group to group together is multicultural uh, grouping multicultural which is every culture they will do the project uh, at the same time in one group because they can have more information or case be, being decided and also they will make few error because they will discuss together more. So next is the third group presenting and the topic is social, uh, social relation, uh, attraction and close relationship and let's welcome me. So, hi, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Amina, and I'll be presenting my topic alone today called Social Reflection in Attraction and Close Relationship. So, here are the key topics that I'll be talking about today. First, I'll be talking about initial attraction, and then we'll move on to close relationship, and then we'll talk about breakups. And then, lastly, we'll end it off with commitments. And this is also why you should find this presentation interesting because I will be answering some few common questions related to these topics. So without further ado, let's begin. So first, initial attraction. So what causes attraction biologically? Here are some of few interesting facts that I found biologically that causes attraction. First is smell. A study conducted as men to smell healthy women at their most fertile time of the month and it, and it was found that women with lower progesterone and higher estrogen smelled better well the research didn't exactly explain how the smell would happen so i can't answer that so second is hormones it was found that men with higher testosterone are more interested in female that have feminine face which is characterized by high eyebrows bigger eyes and a smaller jaw. Now third is, uh, research says that women find men that have a lower pitch of voice more attractive while men perceive women that have a higher pitch of voice as more attractive. And lastly is face, obviously. So out of all the explanations, one explanation that caught my eye is the George Clooney effect. And if you don't know who George Clooney is, he is the guy on the slides. 
So Judge Clooney, in fact, explains that women are more attracted to men who look older. And in fact, the more financially independent a woman is, they are more attracted to men who look older. One reason, one explanation is that women are only fertile during their puberty until they menopause. And while men can father a child until any age, so women get a better offer by waiting until the man has more resources and status due to being older. So then how about psychologically? What causes attraction psychologically? So the first is the proximity effect. It explains that the physical and psychological nearness to others actually breeds attraction towards the person. Second is similarity. So you would find someone who has a, a similar belief or similar values or maybe similar hobbies, more attractive. And lastly is the mere exposure effect. This theory explains that people prefer other people that they are familiar with. For example, you may see someone for a few times over a course of a week. So you would more likely be attracted to that person compared to someone that you have only seen for two or three days. So next, why are we secretly attracted to people who look like our parents? Have you heard of this theory? Well, if you haven't, let me explain. The first is the Oedipus complex. This theory is not really widely accepted, but it was adapted from this theory that explains that a child would have a stage in life where they are more attracted to the opposite parent. And positive sexual imprinting is a process by which individuals use the trait personality of their opposite sex parent as a template for acquiring mates. It also says that people with positive childhood experiences with their parents are more likely to choose partners that somewhat resemble their parent. So let's move on to close relationships. What leads to a close relationship? How do we form, why do we form monogamous relationship? And how do we, and how do people maintain it? So let me first answer, why do we form monogamous relationships? So let me tell you a story. It's adapted and research based on primates. So firstly, it begin with mating. So after mating, the female primate would obviously have an offspring. But because the lactation period is too long, the male primates were not able to mate with this female primate until the lactation period has is over. So what these primates would do was to commit infanticide, which is to kill the babies. But then evolution evolved to combat this infanticide by which the male and the female primates were born really strongly. And it, and it showed that, that the chances of their offspring sur surviving increased. This is because the males have to helped with the parenting. And therefore, the monogamous relationship was born and has evolved into the human evolution. So next, what leads to a close relationship? How do we go from initial attraction to a close relationship? So Mercer came up with this theory that explains that relationship progresses through a few stages. The first being the stimulus stage, which is you, you see the person as their physical appearance or their external attributes. And then you move on to the value stage, which is the values and the need. You start to have similar similarity in the values of a need that you both have. And lastly, you end up at the role stage, where the commitment is based on the enactment of such roles as husband and wife, means you are more committed and you are more closer to each other, to the fact that you actually act as husband and wife. So then now that we know all this, how do we maintain a relationship? So the first is by talking openly. Discuss personal topics together. A partner is there to be your, safe, your, your safety place. So discuss personal topics as a way to bond with each other and, and, to always remind, and to always remember to have kindness during tough topics. Tough topics can be really harsh and can be even lead to arguments. So it's important to stay empathetic and to be kind to your partner. Lastly, argue constructively. Instead of trying to win the argument, instead of that, put aside your ego and your feelings of wanting to win the argument and instead try to focus solely on the problems and the solutions. So next is keep it interesting. Go on dates again, 
go to watch go watch movies together try new things and break routines go on dates dress up as if you have you had met him or her as a first at the first time and um go to movies watch movies together just enjoy things together and keep it interesting instead of you doing the usual things that you do try to break routines because routines can sometimes after a while get a bit boring next is to practice forgiveness and attribution practice for pr practice the forgiveness and also practicing relationship enhancing attributions has has been proven to increase relationship quality so relationship enhancing attribution means that you see their undesirable behavior as temporary or a bad day or it's a sore spot. Like for example, your partner may be frustrated about something. So he may he or she may act weirdly or act in a way that disturbs you. So it's important to see that this is not just something in long term, but it's just a but it's just the situational factors that makes your partner that way. Therefore, you don't see them as just the only infuriating behavior they are right now, but instead you see them as a person that goes through a lot of things too. And then experience together, which means try new experience together. Go fight your fears together. Like for example, you may have a fear of skydiving, you have a fear of heights. So why not try to combat that fear slowly and also doing it with your partner? And it is proven that new experiences can lead to a better relationship satisfaction. But how about during this COVID season, some couples are in a long distance relationship. So let me explain some ways to maintain long distance relationship. Firstly is by assurance. Assurance is by always reminding each other of your love towards each other, which signifies the continuation of the relationship and love. Next is to address good separation which means you need to explain where, when are you going to be separated, why, and when are you going to, how long, and when are you going to meet up again. And also to anticipate of return and future agendas, which means to plan on what to do together in the future when, upon reconciliation. And the third is staying connected. Staying connected is when you're away helps to eliminate suspicion and to keep the love alive. Other than that, you can always go on FaceTime, video call, or you can, current technology these days have really helped long distance relationship a lot. You can even watch Netflix together. And other than that, you can also give symbolic gifts or personal belonging gifts, such as maybe get a couple ring for each other or give your, your favorite t-shirt to your partner. That way, it signifies that no matter where you are, you are always together. And no matter how far apart, you are still together with each other. And lastly, debriefing conversations. Upon reconciliation, it's important to do some catch-up talks. Talk about what you have been through. Talk about some experience that you, went, that you went through. And this will lead to a bonding session with your partner. So next, let's move on to a little bit more sad topic which is breakups or separation. I will be answering what causes it and why is it so difficult. So some of the causes of separations are withdrawal from arguments. Withdrawal from arguments are a form of defense mechanism. And other than that, people who do it often are unhappier and more apathetic about the relationship. This is because withdrawing from arguments too much will cause your partner to feel some sort of way and it is not good to leave your partner feeling negative about themselves. Next is perceived inferiority. This means that you think your partner is lesser or lower than you or you feel you are higher or lower than your partner. And it, should, and it shouldn't be that way because you should be equal. Now third is anger. People you love the most is the person you most likely take anger out on and it's because you mostly talk to them so it's important to be aware of your anger and to always try to control yourself and to think back on how you feel and if you need time to control your anger then it could be then it could you could do you could do it by politely telling your partner that you need some time alone and lastly is the social social exchange theory this theory explains that Relationships are based on rewards 
and you can't be giving more than you take and you can't take more than you give. This imbalance will cause a strain on the relationship. So therefore, it's important to keep it equal and balanced. So why is it difficult? Well, firstly, it can feel like depression. This is because the feeling of a heartbreak is almost has a few key elements that are similar to depression, which is the negative thoughts, constant negative thoughts. And it also feels as though it is griefing over someone that passed away, but actually it's not someone that died but it feels as though you are grieving. It, so heartbreaks is that bad. And second is, it's difficult because it's influenced by external factors such as children, economics, and attachment. For example, um, in a marriage, a divorce would mean children would be involved in terms of, it. children would be involved. Therefore, it's difficult to separate because it will put stress on children. And in terms of economics, the wife may not be working and losing and separation could mean losing her financial security. And attachment means that you have built a relationship with this person for quite some time. So it's really difficult to detach yourself from that person now. And lastly is the broken heart syndrome. Broken heart syndrome explains that when you have a heartbreak so bad that you could feel like as though you're having a heart attack. And this, there is no biological complications that were found, but it was explained that this feeling of heart attack is caused by a, a loss of a person's regulator of stimulation and arousal modulation. So breakups are really bad, isn't it? So let's move on to a bit more happier topic. Enough of the sad news. So let's begin with commitment. So what are the signs someone is committed? Firstly, they don't play games, no silly tests, and they treat you with respect and they're very straightforward in what they want. No silly test means they won't purposely trigger your anger or they won't purposely scheme a plan to purposely make you jealous. N none of that. So they're more serious and they're straightforward. Like if they want something and they expect something in a relationship, they will voice it out. Next is constant support. When the person is constantly there to support you, no matter how bad your day, your day is, or no matter how bad the person, is, no matter how bad the day your partner went through, but they are still there for each other, then that's a sign that they are quite committed. Next, they let you in. They share their deepest secrets with you. They share their insecurities. Sometimes it's difficult to open up to people. So when they actually do. That means they are pretty serious and they trust you a lot to do that. And they're also very open in how they feel. Lastly is talk about future. You have future plans together. You may plan to get married to each other or you may plan to um, have kids together. And you also plan future plans such as financial plans. How are you, are you going to live together? How are things going to be like in the future for the both of you and what you see for each other in the future? So next is, how do we stay committed then? Well, firstly, positive experiences. This is quite similar to how to maintain a relationship. So positive experiences by making memorable experiences together. Like I said before, go try new things together because it can really help in bonding and strengthening your relationship towards each other. Make memorable memories such as maybe going to to a place you've never been to or visiting people you've never met, have new, just new experiences. It could be anything. And next is understanding your partner's POV. It is always important to understand your partner's point of view, especially during a discussion or an argument. You may start to feel like it's getting heated or it's getting intense. So it's important to, instead of feeling more infuriated, you should get rid of your ego and listen to where your partner is coming from. Are they saying this just because they're angry or are they saying this because there are some other reasons behind that they won't speak it out? And lastly is to focus on what matters. Sometimes in a relationship, we tend to pick on the small little things that our partner did and our partners aren't perfect people. 
we are not perfect too. We may have some slip ups or we may have some mistakes that we have done. So it's important to not focus on the small things that lead to that restraint, but instead focus on what matters, which is the relationship that you have bonded through years with that person. So then now that we know all this, why do people get married? So people get married because the need of affiliation. Human humans always want someone to feel that secure base and safety, ha safety haven with. So secure base means adopting your partner as a place or feeling that you can feel secure with them, which in turn will serve the purpose as your safety haven, which is your comfort base or person whenever you feel upset or anxious. So then usually after people getting married, they start to have a family. But why is family important? So family serves as a purpose of a basic foundational social institution. It is said that a healthy society comes from a healthy family. And families are also important because it is a source of emotional, physical, and communal support. And before I end, this is my take home message for everyone. Spread love, not virus. And on behalf of Koma and myself, we would like to thank you for this. I would like to thank you for listening to my presentation today. Thank you for me. So there is very important in maintaining a close relationship with others. We should talk, talk openly to the others to our partners or our friends without forgetting each other good. And we also stop controlling them when they, there, is a, there is a conflict between. And we also need to support their interests. Play, if they like to play a game or they like to travel, then we will just let them travel or, or play game. We don't blame them or scold them. Be a good listener when this is also approach to maintain the closely relationship and she also talked about that we all know that breakup is never easy so some common mistake she point out is the partner will always angle with each other or disagreement but this agreement is is a normal thing everyone have their different point point of view so we must stand on the other side to think and we also, when we have conflict with, with the others, like our friends, our partners, we will still like find some other person to help us to reduce our anger. So this is not true because we need to face the case, like fighting case or conflict case. We need to manage to it and not speak to the others. So the last thing she talked about, if the partner that really like you, they don't play with your feeling. They will always support you and always open to listen to your opinion or anything you share. This is what Lin was, was mentioned in the social reflection in attraction. For the last group, the topic will be social reflection in helping others and social conformity. And so our uh, presenter, which is Shamini Rose, Leung Jun Yi, and me, Miao Ling. So hi, everyone. I'm going to start off my presentation by talking about why helping behavior is interesting or more like important. Helping behavior contains survival purpose. This means that when uh, this means that we are able to survive through a hard time by helping each other out. We can take this pandemic as an example. There are countries which are lacking of basic necessities to fight against the coronavirus. For instance, let's assume that country A lacks of face masks, whereas country B um, lacks of face, uh, medical facilities. So these two countries, when these two countries decide to help each other out by sending face masks, and trained medical experts or doctors, it's going to be in favor for both parties. Both countries are able to fight against the virus and come back stronger together. Next, helping behavior allows social connection. Helping behavior could be an initiation for a good friendship. 
So when we help someone that is in need, there is a high possibilities where we might get to know them well and eventually establish a good friendship with them. Through this, we are able to be socially connected with the people around us. So there was a, two studies conducted on this topic and one was it was done in the year of 2018. So it was found that helping behavior promotes the secretion of hormones such as dopamine, oxytocin, and endorphins. So dopamine is in charge of pro promoting happiness in one's life. Oxytocin is more like known as the cuddle hormone, which makes us feel connected with the people around us. And endorphins reduce our stress levels. So when we help people, we feel more happy, have a sense of connection with people around us, as well as reduce our stress level. And there was another study done by a professor from Harvard, Michael Norton, and there was another professor, a psychology professor named Elizabeth. So they both uh, studied the correlation between happiness and spending money on others. So interestingly, the study revealed that people are more happy when people are more happy when they spend money on others rather than themselves. So whom do we help? People are more prone to offer help to someone that is interpersonally attractive. Interpersonal attractiveness refers to people that are more sociable and seems friendly or jovial when it comes to social interaction. Second, it's about attribution of responsibility, which means that people help when they think that they don't want to be blamed if things go wrong. So we can relate this to our daily life. For example, when our younger siblings seek our help with their studies, we are more likely to help them because we don't want to be blamed or held accountable when they fail their tests. We may think that we are responsible if they fail or do poorly on their tests. So to avoid this feeling, we offer them help. Besides, we help the people that we know and, and we truly care for them. So now let's take a look at the influencing factors when it comes to helping behavior. There are two major factors, uh, influencing factors, which are our mood and time pressure. First, let's talk about our mood and how does it influence our helping behavior. People that are in good mood are usually more spontaneous when it comes to helping because helping behavior promotes happiness and they want their good mood to be sustained throughout their day. And there's a myth which claims that people that are in bad mood are less likely to be helpful. This could be false at times. People that are in bad mood might be willing to offer help to others in order for them to feel good about themselves as, as well as to enhance their mood. Next, next factor is the time pressure. People that are rushing or running late for their work or school may not really offer help to someone because they think that they don't have time to take the responsibility to help someone. But these are just uh, prediction or more like theory because personally, I have encountered people offering help to someone that is in need, even though they are rushing. So we can't generalize these two factors to everyone, to all these circumstances. It may vary depending on the situation and the people's personalities. So now we are going to take a look at the impact of helping behavior. Helping behavior is more like a chain reaction. So the kindness that you show to someone is going to be passed from one person to another. The good deeds that we do will always come back to us at an unexpected time. So one of the impact of helping people is that it makes us feel good about ourselves. As I mentioned earlier, helping behavior promotes hormones such as dopamine, oxytocin, and endorphins. So these hormones are in charge of promoting happiness and relieving stress in one's life, which in return, it promotes our well-being. Through helping people, we are able to increase our support network because we can get along with people when we offer them help, eventually establishing a good friendship with them. So this could increase our support network. It also encourages us to be more active. For instance, uh, if we join activities such as fundraising or volunteering, 
it can cause us to move here and there to collect funds rather than just sitting in a corner and doing nothing. Lastly, it also increases our self-esteem because we are able to feel productive and have that sense that we have contributed something to someone or to the community by helping them. So this could boost our self-esteem. Apart from that, helping behavior can cause us to feel less lonely and less isolated and gives us the sense of belongings. Um, I'm going to take volunteering as an example. When we volunteer ourselves for an event, we are going to meet new people, which in turn make new connections with them. Through this, we may feel that we fit into a group of people or have that sense of belonging when we are mingling with them. Uh, next slide. Most importantly, it makes the world a better and happier place to live because it's not only about being empathetic or showing kindness to others. It's also about creating a good impact on others' life. So if you help someone, you're setting a good example for your younger siblings, your friends, or basically people around you. So it might encourage them to offer help to others who I need. Apart from that, when we offer help to someone, that someone is going to offer help to, to the other person so that the other person can experience the goodness and kindness that they have experienced. So eventually, it molds a positive community in the long term. Next, I'm going to be I'm going to explain on bystander effects in helping behavior. Bystander effect is the presence of others inhibits helping. So when there are number of, there are, when there are more number of bystanders, which means that when there are more people, the likelihood to help to offer help decreases. So we can explain this through diffusion of responsibility. It means that people think that they are not personally responsible for their inaction because others are watching and that others are responsible to take action. So it's more like thinking that why should I help when there are others who are watching and they can help. So the lady in the picture shown in the slide is Kitty Genovese. She was stabbed and murdered in front of her apartment in Queens, New York when she was on her way back home from work at a bar at three in the morning. So the shocking thing about this incident is that there were like roughly 37 to 38 witnesses, yet none took action to do something to help her. So when the police investigated, the witnesses claimed that they weren't uh, aware that it was a cry for help. So they assumed that it was some drunkard uh, quarreling with each other, which causes the noise. So if let's say, if we twist this scenario into something different, if there's only one witnesses that heard her cry for help, they might have they might have felt that responsibility to check what was happening and might have taken the right action to save her. Uh, if they have done that, she might be alive she might be alive by now. So how can we increase helping? We can do we can in increase our helping behavior by reducing ambiguity which means that when we when we see someone who is in need back in our mind we may think that do they really need help do i really have to offer help or wait for the others to help them so we should stop having this sort of ambiguous questions back in our mind and start taking responsibilities so we should step forward and help up, help people out so if we step forward, others who are watching are going to repeat the same behavior in future when they encounter someone who's in need. So if we want the world to be a better, kind, and happier place to live, it should start within us. We should be the change that we want to see in others. Oh, my friends are in this car, and because she's still young, I don't know why she's 
this card, and then I, I was shocked that because this is uh this is organ donation, one kind of the card. If you register, if you register as organ donation, then you will receive this kind of card. So why she is think about? And thus, everyone is interesting to know what is organ donation, but we are afraid to ask. Organ donation. Malaysia, there is 27 million of the people, but only over 136,000 donors. And there is this very, very low in number in Malaysia. There is a higher organ donation rate in the world, which is Spain. So this picture actually shows the organ that we can donate and also a tissue uh, after we die. But for the living donor, they can... Uh, they can donate three things, uh, three of their organ, which is the first one is kidney and also part of their liver or bone, mar bone mar marrow, which is we are familiar. And every four to six hours, there is one person need the kidney to sustain their life. So except for the people who cannot donate their organ, which is AIDS, hepatitis B, C or C D C. So why there is very low number of the organ donation in Malaysia? The first reason was fear. You know that everyone feels fear of pain. So the Chinese is the most uh, most ethnic that uh, fear of organ donation because they fear of pain and then followed by Indians and Malay, which is, uh, as compared to other ethnic, the Chinese is the most fear. But why? Because they lack of indeed information about the organ donation procedure and also the process. So the, the government actually want to help uh, to increase the organ donation in the Malaysia population. But the public awareness and also a campaign is, is less is less efficient because there is still have community they they are misconception about the process. The second reason why smaller number of the donation in Malaysia is religious belief. Religious and cultural factor affect the people decision to donate their organ. So one of the uh, person which is Confu Confucius. He said that humans are born with a complete body should end in the same way after they pass away. If no, they lost any part of uh, their organs, they are showing disrespect to their parents or ancestors. So people will have the stigma that it is important to some, if somebody die, they, they was move, buried with their organ. If no, their organ will maybe fly somewhere else. And so people also are willing to discuss with family about organ donation. Lastly, the third reason why there is a small number of donation in Malaysia, which is social economic factors such as income and education level. There is low income earner report being less likely to pledge compared to, with those who are high income. The study who have done by Lee uh, in 2011, they study the people in urban area and also the uh, countryside. They found that the people with the higher education uh, in the urban area, they are more likely to donate their organ because they have the in-depth information about the process and also a procedure of the organ donation. And they will receive a uh, read more uh, information rather than the countryside. Social psychologists also study that why some people have the action to save the other's life, why they have this kind of behavior. They show that young and have a less traditional religious view are more likely to donate the organ, which is my friend. My, one of my friends, she showed me the card. I actually asked, uh, around my friend, the other's friend, they actually don't have registered this card, so I was shocked. And 
there is a higher level of understanding and had the greatest confidence in the professional conduct of the doctor, which means that the people with a higher level of understanding about the procedure and process of the organ donation, they are more likely to donate their organ. And also, like just now I talked about, individuals with more formal education were more likely to donate than who those who with the less formal education. Thus, it is important to change the mindset for the community about, about the organ donation so that they will, meet, they will not misconception about the procedure and also process of donation procedure after death. There is few theory say about why, why some people have the helping behavior, which is also called the pro-social behavior. One of the theory is umbrella theory, also known as self-determination theory. In order to, for the people who have the pro-social behavior, they must need three components to build up this pro-social behavior, which is autonomy, relatedness, and competence, which is this three is the basic need for achieve the high level of the pro-social behavior. The autonomy means that we can feel control over our environment and we have the free to choose whether we want to register for organ donation or we don't want. We want to help others or we don't want. And another one is relatedness. We must have the connection with the others. We feel the others' feeling so we can try to help them. The last one is competence. We trust ourselves can handle well in helping the others. So we have this kind of pro-social behavior. So when this three component is uh, increased, which is the need is already satisfied, then our pro-social behavior action will also increase. One of the good example uh, for the people who have, for the person who have the pro-social behavior is Mother Teresa. She said that nothing makes you happier than when you reach out in mercy to someone who is badly hurt. She feel happy when she giving a helping hand to the others. So she is quite famous. Another theory also talk about uh, two intention behavior when we help other, which is autonomy helping and also control helping. These two is different. One is you really, you truly want to help the others from your soul. It's like from your compassion want to help the others. Another one is control helping. You be in control by your environment that you want to help others. The first one, autonomy helping. You have the person who are autonomy helping are more likely to be effective in self-regulation of behavior. And as the picture show, their amygdala are larger as compared to the others, which mean that because the amygdala is one of the brain part, they use to control the emotion. So the people who amygdala are larger, they actually are good in recognizing other facial expression. For example, if I feel fear of anxiety, others will also feel that, oh, I'm anxiety or I am fear. So she, have, she will come to console me. So this is uh, what I mean, they are larger uh, in a good, good advantage. And another, another helping way is control helping. Reflex engage in the behavior for externally referenced reason, such as to gain reward or perceive approval from the others. As one of the good instance I can give is that when we when we doing the blood donation in somewhere else, and then we if we can get a bag of the cookies, so we will tend to we will tend to help and we would tend to donate our blood because we can get the rewards, which is the cookies. So we tend to help. We being controlled by the others. We are not compassion, we want to help the others. So this is control helping and also a self-imposed pressure, feeling of shame. For example, if there is an accident, if somebody pinpointing that uh, I must help someone, 
So I must help. Otherwise, I will feel shame. I will feel lost self-esteem. So I'm forced to help the others. And also not from my compassion, not from autonomy helping. Another theory is help-seeking theory. For the people who really need help, they always stress or feeling in trouble. They need someone for understanding and they need someone for guidance. And treat, they need treatment and general support if, it's very, if their case is very dangerous. So especially they need the help from the health set, care service or from the trust people. So one of the Korean singer, he actually commits suicide. He have a tattoo as a picture show. He have a tattoo at the his a part of his body, which is a black dot, like a picture show. It shows that he actually have the depression himself, and he give this suicide signal to the community, but no one will actually realize that he's in dangerous situation. He want to commit suicide, and at the end he was die because of. Uh, this suicide, but when people realize this signal is already late. So the study shows that volunteers are less prone to depression and experience a greater personal uh, happiness and life satisfaction and self-esteem. So they will more have they will have more self-confidence as uh, when they help the others. Another thing is that they have the motivation to a volunteer, which is uh, arise from the early external influence, which is from the parents or the society. Um, if, if our parents always help the others, of course, their child will also follow their parents, which is help the others. So as individuals continue to doing the volunteering activities, they are pro-social value are adopted as a component of the self. So the, the, this means that they have the pro-social behavior and they think that this is the responsibility that I should help the others. And like the picture show, if one of the person, they go and help uh, the, the car, which, which is accident at the route there, if one person go and help, the others will also uh, could uh, resemble and help this situation and also show the co social conformity. And people should learn that volunteering should be promoted by the public health, education and policy practitioners as a kind of healthy lifestyle, especially for the social subgroup of we must help for the elders for the ethnic minorities, those with the little education, single people, or people who has, have lost their job, and also poor health, and less participant in volunteering. There is the lesson from helping others. So helping others is contagious, which means that if you help the others, you will also infect the others to help another person and helping others can make us happy and we will have a sense of the purpose and satisfaction when we help the others and we also will feel empathy to the others when others feel feel we also will have the feeling that they they are feel next i'll be talking about conformity as mentioned by my colleagues just now uh, and i'll explain how conformity is linked to providing help first what is conformity to me, conformity is something that are related to groups. Conformity refers to the tendency for people to have a change in perceptions, opinions, and behaviors in ways that are consistent with a group. People often find it difficult to breach a social norm. For example, uh, if one group ever went out in a group to eat and an individual is still like eating a particular food, but the other insists on eating another type of food, and to go with the group, the individual will decide to go with the food that are picked by the others. And this scenario is known as conformity. To know the big question on how conformity can be linked to helping others, we first have to look at why do people conform. There are two, 
mainly two reasons, the need to be right and the fear of optimism. Now, the need to be right, people tend to assume that when other people agree on something, it tends to be right. When we are doing something or participating in an event that we are not familiar, what we will normally do is we will look around and see what others are doing and we will just follow them. Now, in providing help to other people, our social norms have taught us that helping others are considered as a right act and will conform to what is accepted to be right and help others in most of the time. On the other hand, the fear of ostracism, ostracism meaning excluded. In a group, people who show the difference are more likely to be disliked and excluded. This also applies to helping others. This also applies to helping others. When we are not helping, we scared that we may be judged by others and the society and they will exclude and that can be one of the reasons that prompt us to provide a helping hand to the others. There are two types of conformity that exist, known as public and private conformity. First, I'll talk about private conformity. Private conformity is when an individual are truly persuaded by the others. It changes not only the behavior, but also the mind too. Now, when we look at some of Donald Trump supporters, they don't really support him at the first place but changes to become a hardcore fan after being talked to over and over again by the other supporters. They will even be donating money or drive a few hours just to support Trump's campaign. This change of mindset and behaviors are the example of private conformity. As mentioned at the above by my group mates, there are lots of benefits from helping others. Some individuals are truly perceived by these benefits that are known and they will help others as their mindset are skilled to the benefits. The second one will be public conformity. It refers to a more superficial change in the behavior by pretending to agree but privately do not. This happens when others make direct requests to us and hope that we will comply. One of the examples is that when we are asked to borrow money to a friend, sometimes we find it hard to reject and we just pass the money but privately we do not really want to give. In the context of helping others, this can also be linked to the fear of ostracism. They make us to confirm. An individual who does not want to help others but are scared of being judged by the society who provide help but inside him, he still does not want to help and does not have compassion. As mentioned, the, the act of helping others can be due to conformity but there are some other factors that affect this tendency which will be personalities and culture. There is a collectivistic culture who focus more on the group goals and individualistic cultures that focus on the personal goal. In collectivistic context, we are more cared about the society and group, no matter on goals or how we're being judged, and this will prompt us to confirm to helping others. By helping others, it is also a form of achieving group goals, where other people in a group are benefits. Whereas in an individualistic culture, people are less afraid of being judged, which there are other factors that prompt them to help, such as private conformity, as mentioned above. Now, in personalities, individuals who have a lower status or are unfamiliar with a certain situation are more likely to help. As said above, also we tend to follow what others do most of the time in an unfamiliar situation. Furthermore, individuals with higher needs for social recognition are also more likely to help as they are scared of being excluded in a group and this will prompt them to conform to the norms of helping others the good deed. And yourself on the side of majority, it is time to pause and reflect. There is a take home message that it is not all about money. We can also give our time, idea and energy to build a happier society for everyone. So this is our reference. Thank you for all four group presenting. As summarized, social perception tells us that feel the other's feeling is very important. Imagine that I'm a mental illness people, how I expect the others treat me. Then social influence also tells us that how others will affect our thinking or decision we make when we are doing the project, big project inside a group. The social reflection also tells us that forming a relationship is not so easy. We should preserve our relationship now that we have. And social helping and social confirmation, and also they are related to each other. This webinar 
actually help you guys to more understand and give you information about what really is the social psychology talks about. So thank you guys again for watching until the end of the webinar. Have a nice day ahead. Thank you.